Good morning. Why don't you stand this morning? We're talking on prayer. And we're going to begin by saying the Lord's Prayer. Is that a novel idea? Pray how Jesus prayed. There's something about when you pray the Lord's Prayer. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But when you get to that part, you know, forgive us our sins as we forgive those. Isn't that just like the little heart check that the Lord reminds you? And so... Thanks, CJ. Okay, get organized up here. Let's begin with our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you for the declaration of our hearts to you. We ask, Lord God, today that you would teach us afresh from your word. I pray for every distraction we Thank you, Lord God, for um, even our kids team who were here all night um, with our kids and just the impact that they've brought, many of them even sitting in service today or even just finishing off serving this morning. I pray refreshing over them. I pray great revitalization for their spirits. Lord God, would you, would you teach us something fresh, Holy Spirit, that we would leave here encouraged by your word today, instructed by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, You've been reading the Unshakable Hope book or going to Life Group and watching the series. Hopefully you've um, begun to connect in. And this week's kind of the next two chapters or the next kind of part is all on prayer. And um, I find sermons like this really tricky because I want to just go, you know what, let's not talk about it, let's just do it. And so let's just not talk about prayer, let's just pray for 40 minutes and that might be the best use of the sermon time. Um, And so I kind of had that little conversation with the Lord this week about, I'm meant to teach the people about prayer, but kind of feels like we should pray. And he reminded me that even the disciples would ask Jesus, teach us to pray and it was a good thing to talk about. So um, putting my own even thinking aside, I was thinking about the problems that we have with prayer. I think the number one problem we have with prayer is we complicate it. We make it seem difficult. We think that prayer has to be a certain way. You may even have stood this morning and not known that Lord's Prayer off by heart. And you might have stood there and thought, oh, I don't even know this. This is a bit awkward. Um, And prayer can feel like that. If I don't know the words to say... How do I know I'm saying the right thing? And we complicate something that isn't meant to be complicated. I'm going to show you that through the word today. I think the obvious problem with prayer is we're talking to someone we can't see. Like, let's just talk, let's be real for a second. We're there and we're praying to a God that we can't physically see. Um, I have a lot of very um, interesting children in my house who love to question everything. And um, one of the questions I remember was, why do you pray to God when you can't see him? And I said to them, we'll see that balloon over there. Do you see the air inside the balloon? No. But do you know the air is there? Yes. Why? Because the helium makes the balloon rise. I go, great. Same with God. Just because I don't see him doesn't mean that I don't feel him, doesn't mean that I don't watch the effect of him. Just because I can't see the wind in the trees doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Oh, come on, that was good and you're not. Just because, just because I can't see the wind in the trees doesn't mean that there's not a gentle breeze blowing. So, I heard this week, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is sight. And we are believers who walk by faith and not by sight. The scripture says that we 
We see those things that aren't. Well, hang on. How can we see those things that aren't? As though they are. Because we have to look through different eyes. It's like uh, many of you um, wouldn't know, but on our screen at the back, I mean, I guess you would if you saw the screen, the words for the songs are there. If I don't have my glasses on, I can kind of make it out. I mean, my eyes aren't that bad, but some, uh, some other of you, some other of our team, if they don't have their glasses on, they've got no idea. You think we're just singing the wrong words. Actually, we're singing exactly what we're singing. But we don't have the right glasses on. We don't have the right perspective. We don't have the right focus. But we get caught up in that, the fact that we can't see him. Our problem is prayer is that, our, one of our problems with prayer is that we don't know if we're heard. Like we're praying and we're praying, but does God even hear me? Does my prayer hit heaven? How do I know it hits heaven? We have all these questions and thoughts about it. How do I know I'm even being hurt? Would you turn in your Bible to Psalm 55? I couldn't let this problem go without giving you the answer. The psalmist says this way, verse 16, But I will call on God and the Lord will rescue me. Morning, noon and night I cry out in my distress and the Lord hears me my voice and the Lord hears my voice so every time even you're having a you know I can't pray and this is too hard and I I don't know if I'm hurt in heaven you come back Psalm 55 16 to 17 says that when I cry unto the Lord the Lord hears my voice but we do we wonder does he hear my voice there's this beautiful thought in Malachi that um, Malachi chapter 3 and the imagery is that um, the people of God are on the earth talking and as they're talking um, God is overlooking and recording what they're saying to each other so not only does he hear what you say to him but he's listening in general with his ears poised to the earth, listening to how not only we bring our petitions and prayers and thanksgiving to him, but how we converse with each other. He doesn't separate how we talk to each other and how we talk to him. There isn't the great divide. But that God would be so interested in our voice and what's happening that he would record what we've said. If that's not enough to bring us with the, in the fear of the Lord and go, God, please watch over my mouth. I think sometimes prayer is a problem for us because we don't like, or we don't agree with the answers we get. You know, the answer when we pray and it says that God hears us and he answers us, the answer could be any one of three or four maybe. Yes, no, maybe wait. Yes is the only one we really like. No, maybe, and wait are not my favorite responses. I mean, think of it. He's a good father. Jesus described him as a good father. A good father listens to his kids, but he doesn't give them everything they want because he has a perspective and a bigger picture than they will ever know. And because he's a good father, he might say no. Any parent, auntie, uncle, anyone who's even walked in and seen a kid doing something that might hurt them, even though they wanted to. And they asked to do it. Like today I went in to help just, you know, with breakfast in there and they had some Cocoa Pops. And there are some kids who wanted two or three bowls of Cocoa Pops. I went, no, you can have one bowl and then fruit. Why? Well, maybe I'm a big meanie and that's fine. Um, Because the effect of the chocolate overload is the parents have to deal with it when they go home. So the no was in their best interest. Come on. The no is in their best interest. So when God says no, he's not saying I don't love you. He's not saying I don't care for you. He's not saying that you're not the apple of his eye. He's saying I love you this much that I love you enough to say no. And bear the conflict. Some of us can handle even the no's. 
but the waiting, when he says yes, but just not yet? No one likes to sit in the doctor's office and know that your appointment's coming and you have to wait there. I mean, it's just the most boring place in the world. We don't do it naturally. Waiting doesn't come naturally. We don't like to wait too long. When we know the promises of God that are ours when we pray, it can help answer some of these frustrations of our heart. And so we're going to look at some of the promises of God about prayer today that answer some of those frustrations about how we complicate it, about how we don't know if he hears us, we don't know if we're heard. Sometimes we don't like the, uh, the answer, we don't like to wait. As we look in his word today, we're going to answer some of these questions. Just like the disciples, one of the main barriers for us, I think, when we pray is that we feel like we don't really know how to do it. We keep waiting for someone to give us a magical formula about prayer because if, if they know like the length of time you should pray to get the answer, then if you tell me three hours, you have to pray for three hours. And when you pray for three hours and you do this and you do this, then you're going to get this result. Then we'd do it because we would know exactly what to do. Prayer doesn't work like that. Prayer is about communion. Prayer is about communication. Prayer is not about in, out, in, out. Prayer is about me and Jesus conversing and having intimate conversation. Prayer changes me. Prayer changes us. Prayer positions our heart closer to his heart. Prayer moves our ears closer to his heartbeat. We think prayer gets God to do stuff for us. But the more that you read his word, the more that you realize prayer moves our hearts. Prayer changes us. Prayer moves us to where we should be. Would you turn in your Bibles? We're going to look at, um, we're going to look at that Lord's Prayer. Let's turn to the book of Matthew. Chapter 5. I'm going to start reading. Um, actually, we're going to go to chapter 6. I'm going to start reading from um, verse 1 and I'm going to cut you in. It says, Watch out, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, listen, listen. Okay, so he's going to, this is Jesus talking and he's going to give us some instructions on prayer. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to play, pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues. Right there, anyone who knows their Bibles would stop and say, Jesus, aren't you contradicting yourself? Because right there in chapter 5, you said, verse 14, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Aren't you kind of contradicting yourself, Jesus? Because one minute you're telling us, be salt, be light, let everyone know. Next minute you're saying, don't let anyone know what you're doing. In our house, we would say, I'm very Confucian. It doesn't make sense. Here's what you need to know. He's talking to a bunch of Jewish boys. And so when the translator tra translated this, Obviously, they didn't have the context. And I want to give you, well, they had the context. They knew the context. And they assumed that everyone reading it would know the context. Maybe not even knowing that this many years later, we would be reading this story. The word hypocrite is the Jewish word. And same in Greek, hypocrites is uh, something like that. All the Greeks in the room are like, oh, dear, what is she doing? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> My friend's up there. Um, but that word for us means 
you're not doing what you should be doing. You know, if someone says, you're a hypocrite, the church are a bunch of hypocrites, we, we take that as you're not doing what you should be doing. In Jesus' day and in the day of the, early, of the New Testament, the word hypocrites meant to put on, um, to don't play act, don't pretend, don't put on a show. So you will notice that this passage in Matthew 6, Jesus is making a comparison with the theater. Jesus is making a comparison between the theater of the day and he's using that kind of analogy to say to his disciples, don't be like that. I love it how Eugene Peterson in the message, um, he uh, paraphrases it this way, uh, Matthew 6. He said, be especially careful when you're trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. Note the theater language. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, I call them. Treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage, acting compassionate as long as someone is watching and playing to the crowds. They get applause, it's true, but that's all they'll get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it quietly and unobtrusively. That is the way your God who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. This is the um, commentary that Eugene Peterson writes in the Study Bible, the Message Study Bible. He says this, There are great dangers in the practice of piety. Nothing is as offensive as people who make a great show of their piety. Jesus never spoke more angrily than when he spoke of these people. He called them hypocrites. The word comes from the stage where people put on a mask to act a part in a play. Christian behavior can be put on like a mask. It has the immediate effect on the spectators of giving a pleasing impression, but just as at a play, they will often break into applause. But there is no applause in heaven for such people, and there will be no applause for us if we become their understudies and take their place on the contemporary religious stage. When he's talking about hypocrites, he's talking about us play acting. He's talking about us putting on a show. He's not talking about necessarily, um, you know, don't let anyone know that you prayed today. He's not really saying that. He's saying it's all about the heart. It's all about the motivation. It's all about why did you pray on the street corner? It's, it's why did you pray at the prayer meeting? It's why did you pray in the closet? It's did you pray for um, connection and was it real and authentic? If it was, then go for it. But if it wasn't, be careful. Watch your heart here. Because we can put on a mask and put on a show. Hey, I ticked all the boxes in my reading plan this week. Like I read the word and Jesus knows, Holy Spirit knows nothing sank in this week. You ticked all the boxes. But you couldn't tell me this week one verse that transformed the way you thought. And that's what he's talking about. Don't go ahead putting on a mask, pretending that you're something that really we're not. And Jesus would say to these guys, and he goes on. So keep that in mind. This is the context. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they're ever going to get. So he knows. In the theater, clap, 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 that was excellent, great show. That applause is all you're going to get. So if you've prayed on the street corner and you prayed in the prayer meeting and your motivation was to pray a really good, solid prayer because no one knows how to pray in this prayer meeting, and you go ahead and you pray a big solid prayer, and someone comes and goes, that was a great, oh, that applause there, that's it. That's the beginning and the end. But if your motivation was to seek the heart of God with fervency, was to watch him move, was to come with humility and present yourself before the Lord, then the effect of a fervent prayer avails much. He says this, he says, but when you go, when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private, then your father who sees everything will reward you. Okay. Many of your translations say go into your prayer closet. You do a Google search. He's talking to Jewish boys. We think it means we need to go take all of our clothes out of our wardrobe, get into our closet and okay, 
in Greek homes in the first century, they did, they had little closets. And so this works on the surface level. Remember those, how we talked about the Jewish hermeneutics and we talked about how there's different levels. It works. Jesus withdrew himself to pray, to pray. He found secret places to pray. I'm not saying don't find secret places to pray. I'm just telling you about what he meant when he said it to these boys right here. They had, um, this is a prayer shawl. It's a kid's version of a prayer shawl, but it's a prayer shawl. Um, you go ahead and do a Google search. What is a Jewish prayer shawl? They call this their prayer closet. They call this their prayer closet. And this is how it becomes a prayer closet. Uh, when a couple gets married, a Jewish couple, they have one of these, but a big one called the hoopah, and they get married under the, what is it? The tent. So when they're saying, when he's saying, you know, go into your closet, this is what he's saying. It reminded me of when I'm on the plane, and, and you know, there's that little, I don't know about you, but I sit on the plane and there's that little thought, I need to get my life right with Jesus right now. <laughs> Just before takeoff. And I, and I literally, I know I do this, and I get the blanket and I put it over my head and I have this moment with Jesus just to make sure. You know, it's a plane. I know there's more chance of dying other ways, but I, like, there's just a moment that I have um, and it reminded me of that or it reminded me of Susanna Wesley. She had 19 children. Lord knows she needed prayer, 19 children. And when she went into her prayer closet, it looked like her getting her apron and putting it over her head. And her children knew when mama's apron is over her head, she's praying, don't disturb her. That was her prayer closet. It's not saying don't find a room and pray. Do find a room and pray. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying don't complicate it. These guys wore these all the time. What was Jesus saying? You can pray anywhere. You can pray anytime. Yeah. Anywhere you are, you can make, make a place where you can pray. Okay, you don't look excited, but I thought that was good. Don't complicate it. Don't complicate it. I think we make it, oh, we have to go. I have to have a designated room. I don't even have a special chair to pray in. Get a tea towel. Get a blanket in the, in the plane, whatever you need. Get a private space. Some of you, your prayer closet is in your car. It's the one place that you can just get in and you can be alone with Jesus. Just what he's saying is just pray anywhere, anytime and do it with the right motive and with the right heart. Don't complicate it. It doesn't have to be that complicated. And he says, verse 7, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. And then he says, pray like this. I think it's in Luke or one of the other gospels where the disciples say, teach us how to pray. And I thought, yeah, that's true. Teach us how to pray. And so then he does. He says it this way. He says, our father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins <clears throat> as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Now we think, wow, Jesus taught them a brand new way to pray. That's amazing. Mm. Actually, he didn't. In the first century, they were beginning to develop, archaeologists have um, you can look on there. There's a website called Jerusalem Perspective. Uh, when we were in Israel, we met with a Jewish scholar. His name was Dr. David Biven. And there's a website called Jewish Perspective. You might be interested in looking at that. There's a bunch of other places I can send you to. But archaeologists have found evidence. If you go and Google the word Amida, A-M-I-D-A-H, they talk about this as a Jewish standing prayer. It's the prayer that even today Jews go and they stand... And they say this prayer. Well, in the first century, as the army that was being formed, um, they thought that it was um, after Jesus. But archaeologists have discovered proof that even around Jesus' time and from other rabbis in that time, 
they um, were forming what they called the standing prayer. Even now, I think at noon or at different times of the day, Jews will stand and they will say this prayer, the Amidah. And here is, here is the Jewish Amidah from the first century. Our Father, notice it starts there. Our Father, the one who dwells in heaven, may your name be holy. May your kingdom come as we do your will here on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us today the bread of today. And deliver us from the evil one, cursed be he. Sound familiar? We think that he was teaching this brand new, wow, this is a brand new way to pray. Guys, we have to change everything we know. What was he saying? Pray what you know, guys. Just pray. Like, just talk to God. You've been saying this prayer probably your whole life. Every day at midday, you'd go in and you'd stand and you'd say this prayer. And he's saying, just pray. The way you've been praying, it's not bad. Just pray. Don't complicate it. Are there, are there thoughts on prayer about what to include? Absolutely. And we'll see that in the scriptures. But I think his initial point is he doesn't come in with this brand new series of how to pray. He comes in with, you've been praying this way your entire life. So now the rabbi say, well, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Teach us how you pray. And he says, well, I pray how you pray. Our Father in heaven. There's one part of the Amidah that doesn't exist today. If you Google the Amidah, the original first century Amida has been has morphed into 18 different phrases and it's it's you can still see snippets of the Lord's prayer in it but it has morphed over time but there's one phrase that if you were listening to the two different prayers Jesus taught his disciples to include that they weren't used to including I don't remember reading and forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Remember hearing that? It didn't appear. Later on, as the Amidah morphed and kind of became what it is today, they would include parts on forgiveness. But even today, there is one part of the Lord's Prayer that is not included, even the thought of it, in in Jewish prayer. Jesus said, forgive, Jesus said, pray like this, and forgive us our sins, forgive us our debts, however you want to say it, as we forgive those who sin against us. That was scandalous. Well, we read it like, well, that's ridiculous. Everything Jesus said is about forgiveness. Interesting, hey? We know that forgiveness was the emphasis because now you go ahead and look at verse 14. He's finished the prayer. And then he says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. So what's he doing? He's saying, I know, boys, you think I added that bit in because I didn't know how to pray, but really I did know how to pray. And I'm telling you that that forgive your sins as you forgive others, that should be there. So just in case you missed it the first time when I taught you how to pray, I'm going to emphasize it at the end. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. In the Jewish consciousness, they believe that um, that forgiveness is between you and God. Even if someone else wrongs you, it's between you and God. And you can pray that God forgives them and, and they're beautiful in their idea of forgiveness and going to God. But what Jesus was adding that was revolutionary was our part in forgiving each other and how that related, directly related to how God would forgive you. What's he saying? Stop separating me and people. How you treat people and how you treat me, it's all connected. And right, even even in prayer, 
What do you say? Even when you come to take communion, if you have something against a brother or sister, drop it here, go and make it right. I love it how often when we have, when we're upset with someone, we do the right thing and we don't take communion, but then we don't make it right. We just don't take communion for months because, oh, I can't take communion if I have unforgiveness. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says, leave it, go and make it right, and then come back. But we leave it, oh, I can't take forgiveness because I'm upset. And they're upset with me, and that's not what it says. It says, go and make it right. Short chords. Big grace. The same measure that you've been given. It's the same measure that's given back to you. I don't know about you, but I need lots of grace. I, anyone else in my boat, I need lots of mercy. I, I cannot afford to not be a mercy giver. Can you? I cannot afford to hold a grudge or I can't afford it. Why? Because I need mercy. I need grace. And I know that the same measure that I give it is the same measure that comes back to me. So watch our hearts. Let's watch our hearts. Oh, God. The same measure. The same measure. You know, the Lord's Prayer appears, um, when you look at even the, the Amidah, the 18 phrases, um, and you search it up, it appears like it's an abstract of the 18, very similar to the earliest abstract preserved in rabbinic lit- literature. It's interesting and fascinating as you go through. Here are some promises of prayer. We're going to end with these soon. The first promise of prayer, we're going to go through our Bibles and look at these, is that he hears us. Let's go to 1 John 5. One John five fourteen and says, We are confident and we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. The purpose of your prayer is communion. The purpose of your prayer is that you would know him and that you would know him intimately. Let's not make excuses. Well, you know, I just get bored when I pray. Like I start off really good and I get bored. Who said you had to go and pray for like, you know, hours and hours at one time? What about if, you, if it was literally you set an alarm on your watch and for two minutes every hour you brought your heart before the Lord and, and prayed? Like there is no, I read nothing that says you must pray for hours at a time. I don't read it. I read of people who did that. I read of the effect of that. But I don't read of anything that says I must do it this way. Jesus didn't do that. There are patterns of prayer. You notice the Lord's Prayer starts with an acknowledgement of who God is. And my head says, if the Jewish people knew right back then to address God as our Father, then that makes sense to me. And then Jesus would again reiterate it. Guys, just say it like this. Our Father. That, that, that thought of it acknowledging who God is and his goodness as a good father, that I'm going to bring my heart before him. He acknowledges his place in the earth and that he's holy. Yeah. And then he goes and brings petitions and, you know, let it be done, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he's going to talk about, you know, give us today all that we need. Just bringing our hearts before him and then ending with praise. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the yeah. glory. Yeah. Ending with praise. Beginning with acknowledgement, ending with praise, and bringing um, thanksgiving, uh, bringing petitions in the middle. Philippians four would say that as you bring your prayers, uh, you bring your requests to God with prayer and with praise. The effect, uh, Philippians Paul would say, is that the peace of God will come and settle your heart. Acknowledgement of who He is, thanking Him, and the end. There, the book ends. And then the, thank, the petitions and the requests before God in the middle. I don't think he's so worried about the pattern even. I just think he wants to hear your voice. How long has it been since Jesus heard your voice? Like the true you. 
Not the one that wanted people to know that you were praying. Not the voice even that you prayed with your kids last night to go to bed so that they could hear how you pray. I'm not even talking about you giving an instructional lesson to your kids about prayer. I'm talking about you letting your voice hit heaven. Letting your voice be heard in the heavenlies with a petition and a request with thanksgiving. How long has it been since he heard your voice? Would you let that question just settle a little? How long has it been since he heard your voice? One of my favorite scriptures on prayer, Jeremiah 33, 3. We're going to have a look at it on the screen. It says, ask me and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know, you do not know about things to come. Did you get the next bit, Saz? Okay, let's go. This is what the Lord says. The Lord who made the earth, who formed and established it, whose name is the Lord, ask me and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. Some of your translation says, um, great and mighty things he has in store. Ask and I will answer you and I will show you the great and mighty things that are to come. Does he hear me? Does he answer me? Yes, he wants to answer you. Are you waiting long enough for the answer? We think prayer is just talking, but I'm telling you right now that if I was going to have a relationship with anyone, if, all, if, if George and I are friends and all I ever do is talk, he'd be like, ah, oh, geez, Louise, like, just listen. Can you just listen? I've got something to say. Can you imagine like having a conversation? Hey, George, what do you think of this? And then just keep asking question after question after question after question, never giving a gap for a response. <laughs> never giving a gap. Never giving waiting time to stop and listen. I think I'm like that with God sometimes when I pray. I'm talking, talking, talking. Anyone? No one's looking on the front row, right? <laughs> talking, 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 and we don't wait. To hear the response. And God wants to speak to you and he wants to answer you. And sometimes I think we don't know the answer because we're not waiting to hear what he has to say. Listening is one of the great, I think, hidden aspects of prayer that we forget. Prayer is talking and listening. And talking and listening. And talking and listening. And maybe a whole lot more listening than talking. The third one. The promise of prayer is that the answer is on the way. If you have in your Bible, would you turn to Daniel chapter 10? I know I've had you moving around a lot in your Bibles this morning. It's on the screen. Here we go. I want to first go to Daniel chapter 9. The context here is that Daniel's been praying for his people. He's been fasting. And he's brought a request to God and nothing's happened. He hasn't heard anything. And then the angel Gabriel appears to him in chapter 9, um, verse 20, I'm going to start. It says, I went on praying, this is Daniel, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. And as I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given. Listen. It's what Gabriel says. He's in the heavenly, he's getting the picture. The moment you began to pray, a command was given. Have a look at this in Daniel chapter 10. 
Then the angel said, then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, verse 12. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in an answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Hey. Okay, let's read that again. Don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding. I love this. Pray for understanding and humbled himself. So notice the same thing Jesus is talking about. No strutting your stuff so everyone can see. This is a position of the heart that's positioned before the Lord. And he says, the first day you began, not the, not the 50th day. Not when you brought the request the 50th time. The first day. You began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Your request was heard in heaven. The very first day. Okay. Can you imagine being Daniel? Well, why is it taking so long? And some of you have that question. You have requests that you have been praying for a long time and you've been asking the same question. Why is it taking so long? Well, this is what the angel said. It's not my words. This is what angel, the angel said to Daniel. I have come in an answer to your prayer, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. That spirit prince of the air, his name is Satan, the enemy. So what's it saying? A one of his cohort. So what's it saying? The minute Daniel began to pray, you could, can you just peel back, peel back the curtain a little bit and see kind of a little bit of a thought of what might be happening here that Gabriel lets us in on? Daniel's prayers reach heaven. He says, the minute you began to pray, your prayers were heard in heaven. You can imagine. Can you imagine your prayers being heard in heaven? Can you imagine? Like in my head, I'm like, imagine like loudspeaker and like, you know, my prayers like echoing through that. Can you imagine your prayer being heard in heaven? I don't know if it's like that. This is my overactive imagination. I'm just posing a thought. It's heard in heaven. This is the command we heard before. The command was given. Can you imagine? So Gabriel being summoned with the answer. Gabriel, here's the answer for Daniel. Now go and take it to him. He was a messenger angel. So he's being commissioned to take the answer. The scripture says, who held him up? There was a battle in the heavenlies holding the answer. Why do you think in Ephesians 6.12, we will be reminded by Paul that our, we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but we're fighting against enemy rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world and against all the spirits in, in high heavenly places. Why? Because we are not aware often, that there is a battle going on in the heavenlies that we know nothing about. Were your prayers designed to transform and change and make an inroads? Absolutely they were. And the enemy knows it. So here in this case, the answer is blocked because there was a battle going on. It reminded me of when the Israelites were fighting and Joshua was down there fighting, I think it was with the Amalekites, and Moses in Exodus 15, he's standing and he's lifting up his hands to God in prayer. Every time, what happened? He lifted his hands. What happened? They were winning. And every time he dropped them, the enemy began to take over. In Timothy, Paul would tell Timothy, he says that there was a call for men, for holy men everywhere, to lift up holy hands in prayer before the Lord. Why? I think it was Exodus 17 about Moses. Why? Why would, why would Paul tell Timothy, why are they going to lift their hands? There's got to be something in that. There are seven Hebrew words for praise. 
And one of them talks about the lifting of hands, the clapping of the hands, the singing, the shouting, the twirling, the dancing. All of this could look like, oh, why are you doing that for? That's a bit. No, you don't understand. There's some answers that I'm waiting on. Oh, you're not awake. There are some answers that I'm waiting on. And there is a battle going on in the heavenlies that my praise, my prayer, and my praise, your prayer, and your praise. The scripture says that the Lord goes up with a mighty shout. One of the words for shout is ruah. Literally meaning that, I mean, as Joshua, as they surrounded the enemy's camp, they surrounded Jericho. What did they do? They walked. They just walked. They were silent. And then on that seventh day, they began to shout. Not just a shout, but a loud shout. Not just a shout, but a joyful shout. Not just any old like, oh, I really want my team to win kind of shout. I don't know, but when I went to the Sydney FC game, we're a bit of a soccer family. And when I went to the Sydney FC game and Christian said, look, there's a part of the grandstands, they're crazy as they begin to chant. I've been to lots of different games in my life, honestly. As those, I'm sure it's nothing compared to like a, you know, European soccer league. But as they began... If you've been there, and like I'm like, who are these nutcases going on? It's just a ball. It's a round ball, and, and they are going ballistic on this field. Why? Because they want their team to win. Even in the natural, even in the natural, people understand that when there's a fight going on, they need cheering on. Even in the natural. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting each other. We're not fighting. I mean, that thought that you had about someone you love or someone you serve with or a leader here this week, the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. He loves to plant those kind of stupid thoughts in our heads. But we're not fighting against each other. We have someone bigger to fry. We know that the answer is already won. We know that Jesus, that, um, Jesus was victorious. But it's our job as the custodians of the kingdom. It's our job as the representatives of the kingdom to remind the enemy, You've been, you're messing with the wrong kid. Do you know who my dad is? Do you know he's already won the fight? And he wants to keep reminding you that you're defeated and that you haven't won and that your prayers won't be answered. And you need to look at him and say, you don't know my dad. Because I know him and he hears me and he answers me. And if the answer hasn't come, then I'm not going to worry. Paul would tell us, don't worry about it. I'm going to praise my way till I see the answer come. If the musicians could come. Are you praying prayers that you could answer? Are you praying prayers that you could easily answer yourself? Or are you daring to pray prayers that only God could answer? Are you daring to pray prayers that you need the intervention of an almighty God into your situation and circumstance? It's time for us to think bigger when we pray. It's time for us that when we pray, to let, to let the um, authority of the word of God, I don't have to complicate it. I don't have to you know, wonder, does God hear me? He hears you. He sees you. He loves you. But he said, no, well, that's what a good father does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but he said, wait, that's what a good father does. And I wanted to end this morning um, praying for people who are in the waiting room. We're going to sing something fast and... I want to say shouty. I know that's not a word, but you know what I mean. Maybe um, shouts of joy and victory in E. And 
I want to pray for people that you're in the waiting and you're tired. And the enemy, rather than the enemy and the enemy being silenced, you have been silenced. The enemy is meant to be silenced and stilled and torn apart while you praise. That's what happens when you praise. That's what happened. They sent the singers and musicians in and the enemy was defeated. As Moses stood there praising, the enemy was annihilated. That's the picture of what happens when, when we pray and when we praise. The enemy has to flee. What does the scripture say? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil. And he will flee. Not he might flee. He will flee. This is not a focus on him. This is, this is the enemy. Can you see like the enemy at your ear? And you're like, no, no, no. I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to give him the glory. And he'll deal with you. He actually, he already dealt with you. And so we're literally going to end this service. We've got three or four minutes. We're going to end it in exuberant praise. If you don't have a request before heaven that you're waiting on, then I don't blame you if you sit there and you don't make a sound. But there are some petitions in my heart that I'm waiting on some answers. And the thought that there's a battle going on in the heavens and the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much then I will let my shout be known. I will let my praise be heard. I will let the sound of my voice let the enemy know the answer is on the way and you can't stop it. So I'm going to ask you this morning, if you have a prayer request before heaven that hasn't been answered, I want you to get out of your seat and I want you to fill these altars and we're going to praise Him together. Come on, just get out of your seat. If you have a prayer request before heaven that hasn't been answered, then we're going to hit heaven this morning.